Hi, this is a video response to a discussion about free will amongst various YouTubers. First and foremost, Rabbit Ape. The topic of free will is something I like to talk about anyhow, so thanks to Rabbit Ape for bringing it up. Um, got to say from the start that um, I'm planning to argue for free will in a materialistic wo world, though I'll touch upon the subject of God and free will at the end. Nobody will get a prize for guessing that they won't find these two concepts compatible. I'm presenting this from the perspective of a statistician, a ex-physicist and an atheist. I will not particularly deal with determinism versus quantum uncertainty. I feel that this is a little beside the point. I'll try to build my arguments for the concept of free will in stages, so bear with me. The problem with free will in a materialistic world is that uh, matter is governed by physical laws that you've got no control over. The argument is thus that since these processes aren't controlled by the brain, uh, you've got no free will. My first argument here will be about scale. Uh, basically, you've got to know which scale is most appropriate for your problem, if you want to understand it. As far as scientists have managed to push the boundaries of understanding, the physical world is governed by the standard model of uh, quantum field theory and general relativity. It's assumed that there's a more fundamental law behind these theories, but so far none have been confirmed. Now, if you started with the equations for the standard model, you would see terms for electrons, quarks, photons, gluons, and all elementary particles. You would, however, not see any terms that describes nuclear particles, the atomic nucleus, or atoms themselves. These things are not coded for directly by the theory, but emerges when you deduce the possible configurations of the elementary particles. Now, if you wanted to describe the atomic nucleus, you could conceivably do this by the standard theory directly. But time and time again, you would find structures that you could label protons and neutrons. A more parsimonious description would be to der derive the neutrons and protons once and for all, calculate the properties for those from the fundamental theory, and start describing the atomic nucleus as a collection of protons and neutrons. And if you wanted to describe the external properties of an atom, you wouldn't describe each individual proton and neutron, but rather count the number, assume they're collected in a nucleus, derive the properties of that nucleus, and see how that interacted with electrons. If you wanted to describe molecules, you wouldn't deal with elementary particles or individual nucleus, but rather der derive the properties of atoms as a unit and work from there. And if you wanted to describe a solid, you wouldn't describe each individual molecule, but der derive macroscopic properties from the molecular pro properties and work from there. Each description would be more suited for a given scale, and uh, would involve different concepts for the different scales. For instance, concepts like forms and elasticity is meaningful for solids, but not for individual particles. Similarly, concepts like control, emotions, memory, communication and will is appropriate for minds, but not for atoms. While I'm on the subject of scale, I'd like to mention statements like um, solidity is an illusion because most of the atoms is simply a vacuum. While this does tell us something, I think it's misleading. Mm, something is called uh, solid when it behaves like a fixed form on the macroscopic scale and with moderate relative velocities. It's not an illusion. You can do predictions based on the assumption of solidity. It's a parsimonious and well-founded description on its appropriate scale. Also, I argue that various things emerges from the standard model. Even so, you could think that there's a bottom scale here, but that's quite, not quite so. The standard model has a property called renormalization. The form of the equations are the same on all scales, but the effective constants in the equations changes as a function of the scale. If you want to describe things with a resolution comparable to the proton, 
The quarks are slow moving and each carry a third of the proton's mass and there's a few low energy gluons in between that are just right for holding the slow gluons in place. Scale up that picture and a proton is a collection of high energy low mass quarks with very energetic gluons in between and loops of gluons and loops of quark and the quark par pairs. Just giving a flavor here. The point is that the standard theory itself works differently on different scales, but that the form and the predictions will be the same on all scales. The second argument is about information. A suitable description does not only depend on the scale, but also on the information you've got or that you want to handle. If you want to predict the macroscopic properties of a solid from the molecular properties, you don't want to go into the position and velocity of each individual molecule. First of all, it's almost impossible to gain such knowledge, and secondly, it will hardly matter for the macroscopic properties if you describe each individual molecule, or you just find an appropriate distribution of positions and velocities based on what you know. As I've argued for in my reasoning under the uncertainty series, information affects the probabilities and models involved. If you were only looking for fundamental probabilities, you would be ill-suited for handling uncertainty in general. A suitable model thus depends on the info you, you've got available. Now, if a system contains a lot of relevant states, often called degrees of freedom, and you haven't got access to these states, you'll say that the system behaves unpredictably. It's moving as if it's got a mind of its own. It doesn't necessarily have a mind of its own, but it's got one property in common a certain freedom from you. If you had perfect knowledge about the system and were able to predict perfectly or as well as was possible according to quantum theory, it would be appropriate to say that you've got control of the system. By being able to change the circumstances of the system or the states themselves, you could affect the behavior of the system. But now we come to minds, the person that has the best insight into the system of you is you. You are the one that's best suited to predict what you will do, and if pressed you will be the best suited for giving a coherent description of why you did it. It doesn't mean that you got perfect knowledge about yourself, it means that relative to everyone else, you've got some degree of freedom that only you got access to. So if the emerging property of control and blame is to be assigned to anyone, it's you. Of course, control, will and blame are emergent properties of the mind. You wouldn't assign such things to an atom. So you've got a mind and you've got freedom, while the basic uh, physical components cannot be said to have either. On the scale that blame is meaningful, you've got it. I call that free will. Now, there can be circumstances where someone would understand better what goes on inside you and predict you better. For instance, in a medical brain experiment where you are unconscious, I would have no problem in saying that you haven't got free will in that circumstance, but you'll regain it when you wake up again. Now, I'll accept that my definition of free will is pretty minimalistic and probably not to everyone's liking. Free will has to be more than just a state of knowledge and prediction, you could say. Uh, but even with such a minimalistic definition as mine, uh, there's a complete meltdown for those that invoke a theistic god. If there's a supernatural being that always knows what goes on in your mind, and thus always is capable of predicting your actions, you are never free. The control and blame lies squarely on that entity. Kind of like how God in the Bible controls both Moses and his adversary, the Pharaoh, in Exodus at the same time. This is where Rabbi Ape and me starts to agree again. Free will in a religious context is no more meaningful than a square circle. Now, I've quibbled about what constitutes free will in the physical world, but in a theistic world there's little doubt. There is no free will, and it makes no sense that a rational God punishes sinners and rewards believers. 
Basically, the biblical god is a scaled up version of Basil Fawlty crashing his car for not working. If Basil Fawlty was the designer of his car, that is. <laughs>